welcome friends, both in the present moment and in the future. We're here live at Fiddle Hell Online for a special live recording of River of Suck podcast. I am your host, Andy Reiner, zooming in from Colorado. My special guest today is Judy Hyman. She's a musician, she's a composer, and she lives in Ithaca, New York. Welcome, Judy, to the River of Suck podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Andy. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Looking forward to this. Yay. Well, we've spent a lot of time over the years at some fiddle camps, and I think I first met you when I was a kid and you were a teacher, and then later on we both got to teach at some of the same camps, and it's just a great pleasure and honor to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you, Andy. Uh, hanging out with you at those camps has been some of the greatest joys of my life. Ah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thus far. <laughs> thus far. That's right. We got lots left. So, Judy, you've been on a journey, right? From, from the very beginnings of your life to the you that there is now. And... I'd love if you could tell us more about your journey and how you got to be here right now. Well, you know, I was thinking about it before because I thought you might ask such a question. And besides which, that's what we're talking about, I suppose. <laughs> um, and I have been on a, a long journey and I was thinking about it in kind of chapters and beginnings and flowings and overlappings and all that mm. kind of stuff. I started taking violin lessons when I was about eight. And um, I continued uh, more or less until high school, and I was not a great practicer. But, you know, I had some pitch and some time, and it was going along all right. And uh, in high school, I had a lot of trouble finding a teacher. And so I didn't, I kept practicing, and I was, you know, like concert master of our high school orchestra, but I wasn't really formally studying. I was, I was trying to practice, but I didn't have real goals with it. And um, then I went to college, not in music, and I decided I wanted to get more serious about the instrument. It was kind of bad timing because I wasn't going in music. <laughs> and, uh, and I found myself a teacher. And I just I started to really practice. And the teacher, uh, the first teacher I found was Yumi Ninamaya. Well, she was teaching at Curtis, so she was already a thing. And I was just taking with her privately. And it was a year of, no, that's out of tune. Higher, higher, lower, lower. Because we didn't have machines back then to tell us the truth on pitch. We had <laughs> people doing that. And uh, I think then at a certain point, she got really busy. She was playing on the quartet or something. And I ended up finding another fabulous teacher. I don't know how I managed to get in with these people, but Charlie Castleman, he was an Eastman guy. And when I uh, took with him, he was in Philadelphia. Cool. So anyway, I got to a certain point where I thought, I think I want to get more serious about this. This is really fun and interesting. Fiddling hadn't yet happened. And so I talked to my parents about maybe trying to take some time off. I wasn't a great player. I had started kind of late in a way to get serious. Maybe taking some time off and then coming back and trying to go to music school. And they said no. <laughs> <laughs> no. And they were the purse strings, so I continued. And I spent the last two years of college uh, practicing and going to school and driving myself nuts. I was trying to practice like three hours a day and go to school. You're trying to go to college for something else while going to your own college for 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 a non-degree. Physical anthropology. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> you were torn. I was torn, but I was really gravitating toward doing something with yeah. music. So I graduated, and then I was on my own, and I. Um, spent a couple of years where we were doing a variety of things, living in the country for cheap, and I was practicing a lot. So the senior year, I had a friend who was playing fiddle with a trio. 
Ooh. And I didn't know anything about the fiddle, but I knew she was having a lot of fun. And I said to her, Janet, I need to do something that's just for fun for a weekend in the spring. And she said, I have just the thing. I can get you a ride and we'll go to a festival in the South, a fiddle festival, and I'll teach you a couple of tunes and you'll be good to go. <laughs> so she taught me Flop Eared Mule and Cripple Creek and I got my granny dress on and got into the back of this International Har uh, Harvester truck and it was Jeff Klaus's. And then we got married. No, it wasn't that fast. <laughs> <laughs> my first introduction to fiddle playing and uh it was pretty darn exciting i had never been a, I, I grew up in new jersey what did i know about fiddle playing was that cliff top or, or no that's before cliff top was even before, a thing. Yeah, yeah. that that first one was union grove and so i heard that music and then jeff and i fell in love and he was already all over the music so uh, i got really involved in that um and then I went back to music school and I tried to keep the lives very separate because back then there was no acceptance in the violin world of playing anything related to fiddle music. Zero. I might have gotten you. kicked out if It'll I had, you. you know, if I had said, oh, yeah, I'm playing fiddle at the dances or something. Gosh. Yeah, I know. It's very extreme. It was it was bad back then. You would go into a violin shop and if you played a fiddle tune, they would bring you all the worst stuff. Oh, no. <laughs> and then if they brought you something decent and you said, now that's nice, then they'd go, oh, you know the difference. Okay. <laughs> wow. Such so, condescension. <laughs> really? Totally. So anyway, then fiddle music became really more central after music school. I was kind of like, I know I'm not going to be a, an orchestral player or be in some quartet that would be popular you know I'm, I'm not good enough player and besides which this fiddle thing is really fun it's really social and I like it so I did that for a long 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 time it was a lot of fun and then we moved here I went to music school out in Indiana at IU and from there we moved here and we moved here so Jeff could go to graduate school and we chose here because there was fiddle music here. We had options, nice. <clears throat> but Community. it just seemed like the right place. And it has been the right place for us. It's, we've been here ever since. It's I mean, you're still there. That says a We're lot. We're still here, and it's still a great fiddle music scene. And uh, I have no complaints except winter. <laughs> cool. So on your path to becoming a professional musician, at some point you were a librarian. How did this all happen with your band, The Horseflies? What's okay, the so we came here, we started playing fiddle music with different configurations, and we hit on one we really liked, and we played very small gigs here. But you could feel it growing into something, because it was, it was um, you know, in your life, if you have even one of those configurations where everybody seems like they're on the same page and somehow the music feels exciting to you. That's an amazing thing. And I've had it more than once, but I can't say I've had it like over and over and over again. And so we had this four piece acoustic configuration that was the horse flies. It was me and Jeff and Richie Stearns and John Hayward. And, um, we started to get asked to do things. We came up with the name at one of those festivals. Anyway, we, we named the band as a joke. And then we did two very small time gigs around here. And we had a following by then of about 40 people. And we thought, we don't like this name, but we can't change it now. Because <laughs> we've got our fan base going. And so I guess we're the Tompkins County Horseflies, like forever. <laughs> and um, so, in any case, at that point, um, we were not aiming to be a professional band, and I wasn't aiming to be a professional fiddle player, and I needed to make a living, and I, mm -hmm. uh, I did a lot of library work. I was not a, a, like a credentialed librarian, but I was an assistant who was able to take on a lot of different stuff. And I worked in the music library, I worked in the graduate library here, and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, we moved away. Things were kind of heating up with the band, but 
Jeff got a jo an academic job. We moved to Western Massachusetts. We kept doing the band. In fact, that was the point at which we were making the album Human Fly, and we did that commuting to Toronto from Western <laughs> Mass, and the guys here in New York State would go up there, and we were like flying back and forth. It was kind of crazy. Wow. And when that album came out, uh, it was the, the response was something that I felt like I needed to pay attention to. And so we ended up, Jeff took a leave, I was doing IT-ish stuff over there, teaching software kind of stuff. And uh, he took a leave and we came back to Ithaca so we could do the band. And things were very happy. And we had a wonderful 37 <laughs> year run. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't without its interruptions, but. Oh, sure. It, That's amazing. Idea. Yeah. Um, we retired it about seven years ago, and it was kind of starting to wane probably about 10 years ago, something like that. <laughs> Quit while you're ahead. <laughs> I'm not sure that we did that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> nice. Right around the time, the horseflies had chapters, and we'll talk about that, sure. but right around the time that the horseflies became fully electrified and became more of a rock band, <laughs> We started to get involved in film scoring right. and have been heavily involved in that ever since. And so at this point in my life, there are sort of the competing streams of fiddle music and, and uh, mm. film scoring. Yeah, you're a prolific film scorer, composer, and you even have an Emmy. So that's pretty substantial. An Emmy for Music Composition Arrangement Special Achievement for your score in the documentary, The Cultivated Life, Thomas Jefferson and Wine. I just happen to have that up. Okay. What a topic, isn't it? You know, it's... he's known as the father of the wine industry. Yeah. It's important, but also movies don't have the same emotional gravitas without the music. It's just so important. So people don't think about it when they're watching movies, but it... It's really a big deal. I want to get there in a moment. I have a couple more things first. What makes you feel like you're you -est you? There's a lot of ways that you could be. Like when you wake up every day, what makes you feel like the you -est you that you can be? Boy, that is one hell of a question. Because <laughs> I am not actually just one me. And so there okay, are a lot yeah. of things. In a way, you're asking what gives you joy. Yeah. Right? Are you asking what gives me joy? Yeah. One thing that gives me joy is I love to actually work out. Mm. I really like doing exercise classes. <laughs> yeah. One thing that gives me joy is playing fiddle music and feeling like it's really flowing out. Playing fiddle music with a group of people where I think the sound is really balanced and I like the way everybody sounds. One thing that gives me a ton of joy is working on a film score and getting over that hump of, oh my God, what am I going to do here? And getting just far enough into a cue where I go, I know what to do. And then being able to sort of lose yourself in just following steps that occur to you in this place in your head that who knows what that is. So those are three. And I'm not, I'm not I mean, I'm, overlooking i have a happy marriage of like 80 bajillion years and i still have my parents and my brother and i get along really well but um yeah you i know you're asking more in the musical realm i assume you can answer <laughs> however you want <laughs> i have pretty open-ended but personal questions on this podcast yeah well fire away i think it's time that we took a little journey down the river of suck itself and talk about that because what I really want to hear is how you feel like it's part of your life and your learning process. And the, I mean, the reality is, and this is something I found out doing this podcast, I'm afraid of everything. And you are, I'm afraid of everything. I'm and shocked. The only, the only way to get through this life in a healthy emotional way is to be in conversation with your emotions. So it turns out that that seems to help 
progress when we're, we have these impossible goals. So the river of suck is a thing that has helped me along the path. And the river of suck is an imaginary river that flows through our minds. We are standing on one edge on the shore, our comfort shore. Behind us is our comfort cave. That's where we can do all the things that we already know how to do. Stuff that's easy, comfort zone, all good. Now across, we see in the distance, on the other side, tiny micro versions of ourselves who can do the things that we wish we could do now. Our goals that seem impossible, but the problem is in between us and that future version of ourselves, there is a raging river of suck filled with white water rapids, rocks, <laughs> and thought piranhas, which all represent obstacles in our path, right? And thought piranhas are those crazy uh, self-defeating loops that we get into. Like, I'm not good enough. What do they think of me? This idea is bad. And they're not going away. They're part of us. So the idea of the river of suck is that you have to swim across one stroke at a time. There's no magical bridge or boat. Although if you can find a bridge or boat to reach that goal, sure, build it, find that path. You just can't realistically achieve a goal that feels impossible by skipping all the hard work. There's a lot of little micro steps and a lot of people now, especially in this internet era of social media, they see someone who's doing something amazing and they think, wow, I'll never be able to do that because I'm not that level. I'm not an expert. But the reality is anyone who's ever been successful at what they're doing has struggled. And so <laughs> what I want to know is how have you struggled? Does this analogy make any sense in your life or your music? And yeah, what do you think? The only thing about what you described, and I love thought piranhas, but the only <laughs> thing about what you described that doesn't resonate me is yeah. that you used the past tense. Oh, right. <laughs> I deal with river of suck every time I get the instrument out. Mm -hmm. I deal with river of suck every time I do things where I go, who do I think I am doing this without some kind of academic preparation for it? <laughs> do I know what I'm doing? Is, does this sound okay? Um, so I, I would say that, that um, I don't know, we could go into a uh, competition for who has the most thought piranhas. <laughs> I mean, I had River of Suck today just warming up to teach my class earlier. That's, wow. that's just like an everyday kind of thing. So um, there, there are things I say to myself to get myself to keep doing the things I do. Right. I mean, what would I do if I weren't doing this? Play tennis? <laughs> Play golf? Watch TV? Uh, what would I be doing? Okay, I don't want to do those things. I want to do this. So then I go, all right, so you're not feeling great about how you do this, uh, but just do it. Yeah. Something, you know, my dad is a musician, and something he said a long time ago to me and I found it really incredible because I didn't know he thought this way because he's he was at the top of his game. And he said, Jude, there will always be someone who plays better. Always. You can't let it stop you from playing. Right. And I was like, you think there are people out there who play better than you are? Do you do? And, you know, as I grew up, I realized that probably there are. Definitely there are. But certainly in my case, I've always seen myself kind of in the middle of a pack. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't let it stop you because what are the options? If you love music, <laughs> then you do music. You know what I mean? Yeah, no doubt. So you have like affirmations basically that you say to yourself when you're not, when you're not feeling it, but you got to show up. I don't know if they're verbal affirmations, but I have a lot of persistence and right. patience. And I have become comfortable with the fact that I progress at the pace I progress at mm -hmm. and that I do the things I do and 
that I'm not the best composer in the world and <laughs> not even one of the greats. Uh, but but like I say, if I didn't do that, that whole area of joy would disappear. There, okay. There's nothing like creating a piece of music and then looking at it and going, I nailed it. That's so great. I love it. Right? Or there's oh, nothing no. like going back and listening to a project five, ten years later or more and going, wow, we did a good job. This, this thing really hangs together. So yeah. I get so much satisfaction out of that kind of thing that I'm willing to kind of ignore the suckage along the way. Um, you don't get anywhere if it takes you out. Right, right. And the process is messy, right? Of composing, of creating, and judgment of your ideas as they're happening. It's all messy. It's <laughs> all messy. You have people, uh, you know, listening, critiquing, rewrites, more rewrites, um, your own suckage. Um, yeah, it goes on and on. And with regard to the instrument, you know, I'm old enough that I have watched what's happened over the last, we'll call it 50 years sure. of playing, and it's gotten so good. <laughs> Your generation is like, it's like blowing me away every minute. And <laughs> So I could say, well, they don't need me anymore. I don't need to do this anymore. But I like doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's really the bottom line is to get in touch with what you want to do. It, it doesn't, I don't think it has to be raging success. Totally. It'd be satisfying. But, you know, you said even today you picked up your instrument and you're like, oh, no, I'm in that river of suck. I mean, I think the fiddle and the violin in particular as an instrument just inherently brings us more suffering than a lot of other instruments. Like a piano, you push the button, you get the sound. And that's not to say there's not a lot. <laughs> I see my brother Eric here. He He's an amazing pianist. But just to make one darn note on the violin, we have to suffer. <laughs> So to, to such a deep level and show up when it's hard and we're not feeling it. So how do you show up when it feels hard and you don't want to be there? You'd remember what, what joy it brings you. What do you do? How do you get there? Um, well, I mean, I have to get myself to a point where I'm, I'm happy with what I'm hearing. And right. so particularly, you know, with this negotiating the different worlds of activities, I have to uh, make sure that, say, before something like Fiddle Hell, that I've practiced my ass off for a while, right? No doubt. There's just no way around it. And I know people think old time fiddle is like whatever, but for me, <laughs> nothing is whatever. <laughs> it's, all, it's all a lot of time and prep and thinking and, you know, uh, you know, you, you said something uh, when we were talking on the phone the other night about, uh, you know, practice kinds of things. What do you do? Yeah. I still do Shradiac. Cool. The, we can't escape the basic foundations of playing the instrument. You got to get the fingers to go down. And, and I'm going to tell you that as you get older, they're less and less compliant. And you mm. have to beat them into shape. Oh, yeah. And well, yeah, you know, and then when you have these other other activities that you're spending copious amounts of time with, you know, then you're not spending as much time on the fiddle and you pick it up and go, whoa, that's terrible. I should say that a lot of times um, I'm, I'm teaching privately less and less these days, but people will approach me and they'll say, oh, I really want to play the fiddle. You know, I'm 60 years old and I really want to play the fiddle. Can I play the fiddle? And I go yeah, how much time are you planning to put into it? That's right. And if you don't want to put in a ton, ton, ton of time, try an instrument where tone production isn't like the first year of it. Try an instrument where <laughs> holding it with your head isn't a piece of it. You yeah. Know? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, having realistic expectations 
is a huge thing. If you have unrealistic expectations of yourself, you're just setting yourself up to be disappointed. And that's the downward spiral of of sadness and bleakness that, that we want to hopefully avoid <laughs> if we want to have fun in music. I think that, that you have to keep that goal of the fun part out in front of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and when you start to do that spiral downward, take a step back, take a few breaths and go, why do I do this? Is it still a valid reason? Do I still want to do this? Re-examine your motivations. Do I still want to do this? What am I getting out of it? What do I get to do that I wouldn't get to do? And do I enjoy it? And why? Why, why, why? <laughs> and at least so far in my life, the why has always been because I like it. Yeah. I think it's really healthy to ask yourself these questions. And then you really know where you're coming from. If you don't know where you are and you're not being honest with yourself, it's hard. It's a lot harder. You know, I've known people who were spectacular players. I'm thinking of one right now who uh, was an amazing rock violinist. Amazing. He used to blow me away all the time in a band around here that uh, after a while they, they disbanded. And he set up a business as a landscape person <laughs> and became an amazing skier. <laughs> and did a lot of, in the summer he'd do landscaping and in the winter he'd go teach skiing and ski. And he didn't touch the violin for years. He raised a family of four. He was a happy dude. Wow. So that's something else I say to like a student who has gotten to a certain point and they're thinking, well, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I usually will say to them, well, let's examine that decision. Let's figure out, you know, whether it's an impediment we can get over, but the violin isn't for everybody. But make sure you fill that time with something creative. Don't right. just like, you know, eat Cheetos and watch TV. And just to be clear, we're not dis trying to discourage ever anybody. <laughs> we just want to be realistic with the fact that if you want to have the sound in your head of what you hope to sound like, that's a far away shore just in tone production on the River of Suck. Not to mention learning all the notes and making them feel right. So this is this is why we're all here at Fiddle Hell. I was going to uh, say, this, this place in particular, out. Little Hell, is a place where you meet so many people who have made that decision to take on the challenge and say, I really want to play this instrument. I yeah. enjoy playing this instrument. I enjoy jamming with people. I enjoy learning about it. I want to know about different styles or I want to know about one style deeper and deeper. Um, it's incredible what happens. Well, community, that's the idea of the River of Suck swim team and why it's sort of a joke, but it's sort of not a joke because we're we're all in this suffer fest of trying to accomplish our impossible goals together. And I feel like the more support you have and the more we talk about it, the more we realize that when we're suffering, we're not alone, the easier it is to ask ourselves those important questions. So, yeah. <laughs> I think also people don't necessarily see you in a setting where you're just being yourself talking and they start to, to <laughs> superimpose all this stuff on you that, that, that your life, your, your you know, involvement with music hasn't been hard and that it just came easily. Well, no. <laughs> well, there's, there's the public view, you know, where I, I actually watched your workshop earlier and you were very patient. It was a slower paced workshop. You were extremely good, extremely on it, extremely patient and extremely methodical. And that's all that we saw. But you're telling me that it took a lot of prep, both previous to the class and it also took warming up and getting yourself in that mental state. So sometimes, you know, that's why I ask people, what do you do? So we can, we well, what I did in preparation for the class, as an example, right. yeah. you know, it's, it's a simple tune. Lots of people already know it, but um, it was Julianne Johnson. Julianne Johnson. And, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I needed to make sure Jeff knew the chords. So we rehearsed it a couple <laughs> times this week, a few times this week, because I think I also want to do it in the jam. And so, yes, we've been preparing for the jam and choosing tunes and practicing, and making sure we've got the chords right and everything. 
But then I sat down and figured out the order I wanted to teach things in. It's just a, you know, a level of preparation so that, and then I figure I, I've done this enough times that I can look at the clock and go, time to get to the second part. Totally. Time to get to the one Boeing. I decided it would be one Boeing. I mean, being prepared is, I think, one of the best ways to not be afraid of a situation. And maybe a situation is terrifying and you're never going to overcome that fear. But realistically, if you go in, let's say like you go into a gig knowing zero of the tunes and the songs, that is way more <laughs> scary than going into a gig where you know everything that's about to happen. So, you know, I just think one of the best strategies for avoiding <laughs> crippling feelings in a scary situation is just to have to make sure to give yourself the time to prepare. Preparation is all. And I, I have all. to say that, that um, one of the things that's useful in a personality type to do the things that we're doing, because I know you're also writing and arranging and preparing scores and doing all that kind of stuff, yeah. is um, it helps to be a little bit of an introvert. And hmm. I know that people think that people who get on stage and do things in front of a lot of people are extroverts. Some are, but many aren't. Many are just, they love the music, they feel like they have something to offer that people will uh, enjoy listening to, that they're proud of on some level. And they get up and do it, but, but they're very comfortable in those long hours in the room by yourself thinking things through, getting things organized, pulling things together, hmm. practicing. Totally. But you know, Andy, this is, this is really interesting because <laughs> I thought, I think of you as extroverted <laughs> and I think of you as fearless. So this is really interesting. Well, I practice a thing called pretend confidence. <laughs> I also, I try to be in conversation with my fear instead of, um, running away from it and hiding it in my emotional basement. I've made some big personal emotional strides since doing this podcast. I thought I was fearless. I'm not. I'm scared of everything. So being honest with yourself means being in conversation with your with your feelings. And uh, yeah, people see one face that you're trying to present, but it's not the full picture. And it's really important to remember that when we're intimidated by our heroes. <laughs> Because they're people too. We're all people. We all have feelings. <laughs> I've heard I've heard Daryl in, in in workshops uh, talk about this sort of thing, and he, he he'll he'll just throw off phrases like, "Well, these are the issues that we deal with every day as violinists," <laughs> and you go, "You too? Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah, we're all in this together. I want to talk more about composing." When you're trying to create ideas, how do you not judge them too much so that they can exist pre-judgment? How do you let them flow out before you have to kind of edit them? Well, I should say that I'm a composer that works for projects. Right, right. And I've had a lot of trouble composing just for the hell of it. Hmm. And then when we have a period where there aren't as many projects, I start thinking about, I should write a quartet. I should write, I should do this. I should turn this old cue into like a quartet piece or whatever. And then we've been fortunate enough that something comes along and then I don't have time to do that. So I, in a way, because I'm almost always, not entirely, because sometimes between projects, we're learning new software and are trying things out and I'm not under pressure, but I'm almost always under pressure. So I don't have a ton of time to question whether I'm on the right path. You know, you talked before about people don't think about uh, uh, how much music contributes to a piece. And I just want to say that getting a film with no music in it <laughs> and having somebody say go is terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's terrifying. Uh, sometimes they'll send it to you with music and sometimes they either want you to mimic the music or they want you to do something entirely different. So what I'm trying to say is that if I were left to my own devices, I would have a lot more of that 
time for the thought piranhas to get the better of me, but I'm under pressure. So I just go, okay, that, I don't know about that idea. Follow it out. Where did it go? And one of the things I've found is that for the kind of writing I do, you can start almost any, anywhere. It just depends on how you develop it. Yeah. Wow. Cool. I mean, parameters are everything. The blank page is, is actually the scariest thing. But the second you're trying to create a certain effect, yeah, I can't write anything without having some sense of where it's going. Otherwise, it's just, I mean, this, this is the scariest thing. I'm holding up a yes. blank That's notation like a blank, paper here. It's blank like page. a blank film. What do you do? So, what are we so going to do? One time I went to a talk by a poet who lives here, who teaches at Cornell, and somebody asked her, you know, how she goes about uh, inspiring herself and then completing stuff. And she talked about self-assignment. Hmm. She talked about actually sitting down first and going, this is what I want to accomplish with this poem or this suite of poems or whatever. And I've tried that, but it doesn't really work for me. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Well, this hour goes by really fast, so I want to make sure to ask you about the horseflies and and your time in the band. I'm particularly interested because from my perspective, I just I'm a fan of the band and I love the the old albums, but Until the Ocean in particular is one of my favorite albums of all time. So, I love it. I love the band. I love the music and I got to see you guys live at Falcon Ridge one time. It was amazing. Uh, but I want to hear if there's any struggle stories you can think of within that band. Cause I, I just see it as being amazing, but I'm sure something happened that was a struggle at some point. <laughs> uh, yes, we were together on and off for 37 years. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what I would point to is that making albums is hard work, mm. particularly the way we made albums. I mean, the first one, we just, we played fiddle tunes and we played a couple of songs. One was an original and, and one was a, a reworking of a, of a reggae song. But thereafter, our vision always got really complicated. And so just the process of, at first for Human Fly, four people plus... <laughs> the producer who becomes almost like a part of the band and the way they work with you and getting everybody on the same page and trying to figure out what everybody's vision is and making that happen is a huge struggle both musically and interpersonally um although i have to say we were so much on the same page on that album that there was less of that um, the next album was gravity dance and that was also very complicated. It's, I mean, you're basically in there trying to do your best and asking people to do things and having people ask you to do things and, and spending a lot of money that always puts tension on anything and, uh, having some level of aspiration, even if it's kind of cloudy and unclear. And so, and until the ocean also was was lots of struggle in the studio. Um, I I won't go into all of those struggles because at that point, uh, in particular, one of the band members was having some personal stuff going on that um, made it really tricky. Hmm. But um, making albums is hard work, <laughs> hard hard work for us. Some yeah. people just go in and they play and then that's it. But we always wanted the albums to sound like more than we were in a way. And right. then we would try to catch up. So, you know, when we made Human Fly, that was, yes, we were playing at the core of that, but we also uh, embellished it with a lot of stuff and then tried to figure out how to recreate that because people were asking for that. And um, yeah. That's wild because a lot of times people are struggling to capture the live vibe and how do you do that in the studio when it's so dry and you're kind of talking about the other way. Well, it's a little, it's both because right. you need to get that live energy and I'm not always sure that we have 
but um, you need to get that live energy. And then Jeff and I are believers that if you just get raw footage off the floor, it doesn't transcend. It's a different medium. Sure. It's not the, it's not as exciting as sitting in the room with the people playing it and you're going, oh my God, this is so incredible. There's something <laughs> that lies flat when you get it, particularly out on CD. CD's kind of like... Um, <laughs> so we always... And we also always had a vision that there were things we wanted to have happen with the music that you couldn't do with just the people playing. Mm -hmm. We wanted to add things. So we did a lot of, you know, multiple tracking and using them. Uh, we did a lot of like, say, taking the uke and having him play it twice and making it stereo. Um, you know, stuff. It's not cheating. It's studio magic. It's definitely not cheating. It's its own, it's its own <laughs> art form. It's, it, it, we were never trying to render what was on the coming off the floor. We did, you know, make one live album. And, the and dance tent. Yeah, we did it the only way we were capable of, which was we didn't know it was happening. <laughs> we just, we played a set and five years later or something, some guy sent, I think our sound engineer, a tape and said, you know, I recorded that set off the board. And then we listened to <laughs> it and went, well, we're never going to make a live album that works any better so let's just do it <laughs> also i should say for the live album uh by then our dearly beloved john hayward had passed away he passed away in 97 and so that was a way of of uh commemorating him mm. but also you know just the challenge of you know, like how does this uh how, how do you get it off the floor that way there were three percussionists in there that was part of what made the recording work i think is that that really filled it out well they have to be really good for that to work so they're really they were, good they were dynamite all three <laughs> of them. and they loved playing together they yeah and you're also some of the few old-time musicians who don't shy away from drums and percussion in the sound i respect that there are a lot of people who hate that <laughs> there are a lot of people who hate the banjo uke <laughs> there are a lot of people who hate what we did. It wasn't old time music after all anyway. But you know, that's part of that whole river of suck. There is no uniformity of opinion. Right. And then you step back and you go, why am I doing this? Because this person maybe just said a terrible thing or, or I know these people are unhappy with what we're doing. Why am I doing this? Because I want to because I like how it sounds, or it makes sense to me. And you definitely, in the music world, don't have to please everybody. No, but a lot of people lose a lot of sleep trying to. So it's amazing well, that you've had a band where you could play the music of your heart. Uh, part of that was I worked for a living. Right. Ah. I didn't rely on it. So I never had to do any general business music. Um, so, uh, did all of us work? Uh, several of us worked and a few of us didn't. I mean, we were a big band, so we weren't all on the same page about all of that. And so that took the heat off it. Cool. Well, everyone go listen to the horse flies. <laughs> Amazing. You've also spent a lot of time with your father and someone with a musical father himself. I know how special and cool it is to work with your dad. So tell us about your music with your dad and what things that has brought up for you. Um, in, uh, I think it was 2012, I made an album with him. And it was an album of my original waltzes. So it was kind of me leading the charge. And I have to say, my dad is has always been a monster player. I've had a very nice career and a really good run, and I can't complain about every anything. And on, I would call it a lesser level, I've gotten to do a lot of the things that a lot of big time people get to do. But that means that he was always the alpha in the musical equation. And I had to step up and be the alpha for this one because I, I had the vision of what I wanted this album to be. And he's an amazing improviser and so 
things weren't always exactly what I wanted, and then he wouldn't remember what he had done, and he'd do something else, and I didn't <laughs> like it as well. So both on the level of figuring out procedurally how to capture, how to ask him for the things, be clear enough to ask him for the things I wanted, how to give him enough space to do the things he's so great at, and also how to how to take on that leadership role in the studio. That was terrifying, Andy. <laughs> that was terrifying. You know, I have to also say my dad's still with us. He's 96 years old. Mm. Uh, yeah, he's still playing. He played his what, what he's calling, and I think it will be his last concert about two weeks ago at the Sarasota Jazz Festival. And uh, anyway, that 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 experience of doing that album with him was very game changing in our relationship uh, in a very cool way. For one thing, he came up here on his own. My mom did was not here during all of that. And he was here for a week. And it was really cool. It's like a different kind of uh, interaction when you're on your own with one parent and not the other. <laughs> I think, at least in, in my family dynamic. Yeah, I mean, people's presence changes how you think about yourself. And when it's someone who's known you as long as your parents, it's certainly true. <laughs> yeah. And when you have that ingrained a dynamic and you're trying to flip it hmm. and, you know, he had to get with the program too. He had to go, yeah, right. It's her album in a way here. <laughs> and I need to listen to what she's saying. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, you're like, oh, well do that thing again. And it's funny as an improviser, when you do something and someone's like, that's cool, do it again. You're like, do what? What did I do? That's right. And this was oh. before I had a cell phone. So oh. I was running around with a, a little Panasonic handheld $19 thing. And I was taping everything. And <laughs> then I was kind of uploading it onto my machine and editing the parts I wanted. And then right before he played it in the studio, I'd go, remember this version? This is what I want. <laughs> nice yeah <laughs> remind ourselves of what our best versions of ourselves did in the past when the pressure was off and it wasn't the real recording <laughs> well, it's hard it is hard i'm trying to take the pressure off now i mean the music i play live yeah. i'm trying to just completely take the pressure off i've stopped playing on sound systems for the most part i played on a sound system at fiddle hell but you know we used to really gear it up and you know, get up there and set up racks and amps and whatever. And I don't do that anymore. Most most of the time we play local kind of sit in the corner. People can yak. Uh, let's play some fiddle tunes and let's socialize between the tunes kind of gigs. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> nice. Wow. Well, I've asked in the chat if anyone has any questions for Judy since it's live. It's kind of fun. Anybody I'm going to let there? Cleo unmute to ask this question. Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. Oh, great. It's funny that you mentioned Julianne Johnson because that was one of the tunes that um, I play at one of the jams that we go to and I practice it like heck. Um, and they, they play kind of on two and four and I, their speed is about 120 with the fiddlers. So I'm practicing at about 80. So 80 is a long way from 120, but my, um, my backup chops are getting really strong. I'm being very creative with it, but my melody chops are not improving as fast. I, I started at 60, so from 60 to 80 is an improvement. I, I'll I pat myself on the back, but it's nowhere close to 180 in the way, the way they play. Yeah, so I, I have something uh, yeah. you may find interesting to say about that. Okay. I've never been a particularly fast fiddler. And in the old days, when I was really at the top of the fiddling game, um, I still played at a tempo, maybe like 108 to 112, where the cloggers were always saying, faster, faster, faster. And eventually, contradancing got faster. And they were all saying, faster, faster, faster. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't really do that. It doesn't really fit with how I hit the beat or my skills or whatever. And these days, I'm hovering between uh, 90 and 105. 
And I just, if, if there's a gig that needs more speed, like a square dance or a contra dance, I don't do them anymore. So, you know, how do you get there? I can tell you theoretically how you're supposed to improve speed by doing bursts and by working. Metronome, right? Yeah, metronome and then, and then also just metronome and working it up, but also playing a little phrase really fast and then right. another little fr and then trying to get them together really fast. Perfectly honest with you. It never worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I personally, um, I'm lucky to be married to Mr. Groove and, and Mr. Groove really likes my tempo. And when we play with other people, they kind of lock down to us rather than us locking down to them. So I applaud your trying to, to work on it, and you should keep working on it. Right. But I would also suggest that you <laughs> find people who want to make the music that you are able to make. Yeah. And make that sound good. Because speed ain't, speed ain't the whole thing. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Cleo, for that question. And, and then find me at Fiddle Hell yeah. in November and we'll play at 80 because I love 80. <laughs> <laughs> we actually did a beautiful song called The Colored Aristocracy at about 85. And I was able to do the entire thing and do backup and come back and do Melody. So it was mm. so satisfying. Thank yeah. you very much. I think it's a beautiful tempo when you get all the backup really chunking on the back. Exactly, beat. exactly. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> I also want to say in terms of the river of suck analogy, it's important to be able to love where you are in the moment when it's not the ultimate goal. Because if you have no love for your playing when it's not what you want it to be, <laughs> it's just hard. It's like a lot of criticism. And like you want to think critically like, oh, how can I improve this? But realistically, on these string instruments, it also means that it's going to sound rough along the path to getting there. So remembering to love where you're at. There's a lot of satisfaction in seeing your own improvement. And mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, I mean, for me, it's just like the working out thing that I alluded to at the beginning of the hour. I find a lot of satisfaction when I finally can put another weight on the bar, right? I am not a strong person or a great bodybuilder, but it's better than I did last week, and that feels really good, and that's super important. <laughs> because, as Andy said, there are no, there is no leaping. I mean, there is no leaping. I, I mean, the greatest, greatest players that are running around right now, I know how much time they've put into it since they were children, you know. This episode might be titled Better Than I Did Last Week. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the team on it. Well, tell us where we can find your music and how we can support you. You've got websites and where do we go to find your music? Well, I have a website for myself, judyhyman.com. Mm -hmm. Go figure. Um, but I'm not selling anything out there. <laughs> I'm not a big merchandising person. Um, but it will uh, take you to the Horsefly site where you can, it, it will, the Horsefly site will tell you where you can buy things. Some of it's on mm -hmm. Amazon, some of it you write to me, uh, whatever, it's all there. And if you're interested in the Waltz album, I'm pretty findable. Just find yeah. me. I have a thousand in the basement. I would, I would love to give them to you. If you cover the postage, <laughs> I would love to give them to you. <laughs> Yeah, and you, you've also got on judyhyman.com, you've got film scores so people can see what, what movies and documentaries they should they should watch if they want to hear your music. And you've got some sheet music and maybe some gigs listed, some camps you're doing. So, ah, look at that. There's Fiddle I want to talk Mine. about the sheet music because that's all free. And I don't know um, who might hear this, who might say, well, I'd like to check that out. So I did lead sheets for the, all the waltzes on late last summer. And then I've done uh, some arranging of some of them, a quartet, a trio, yada, yada, a duo. Um, and all that stuff is just there for the downloading. Have fun, enjoy. Tell me about your adventures and escapades with it. 
Uh, feel free to write. <laughs> yeah, we got to wrap it up. So I can't thank you enough, Judy, for being open and honest and joyful with, with all these tough personal questions that we ask here on the River of Suck. No one ever said crossing the River of Suck was easy or that you had to do it alone. So we want to thank you for tuning in, giving it a chance. <laughs> You can join the River of Suck Swim Team at riverofsuckswimteam.com for just $1 a month and support this podcast. We appreciate it very much. Oh, yes. And thank you, Judy Hyman, once again. You are awesome. And you're the greatest. <laughs> Till next time. Keep swimming. All our live people. Keep swimming. 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 Keep swimming.